It's been a tough year. Famine and disease. Political strife. Security barricades have apparently been breached outside the Capitol building. Economic hardships. Natural disasters. It's been a tough, hard, relentless year. But the challenges of today do not define us. We know the glorious and victorious ending to the grand narrative that transcends the earth, all time, all things. The loudest voices may take the day, but the meek shall inherit the earth. Disease and pandemic may ravage, but he will wipe away every tear. Lockdowns and travel bans may ensue, but his purposes cannot be thwarted. Men and women may fail, morally, spiritually, miserably, but the light overcomes the darkness. The heartbeat of God's people is the vision he's given us in Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Hear the echoes of the saints who have gone before us, the giants whose shoulders we now stand upon. It's a groundswell of ascent, a solidarity born of one accord, a consensus worthy of pursuit. We are united for the sake of this cause, to see the world transformed by the gospel. The name of Jesus proclaimed in every corner of the earth. We will not let the hands, the voice, the lies of a defeated enemy divide us. Together, we will advance the kingdom of God. We give ourselves to this mission every day. Well, at Clear Creek, we know what it means to give ourselves to this mission every day, amen? And so we've answered that call, and we pray for those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ serving that call all around the world. I do want to remind you that we are currently in the process of receiving uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering to support the work of international missions. And so our campus-wide goal is $750. The envelopes are on your way out, uh, as well as the offering plates. And so you can give to that as you are led to do. I do want to say just one thing by way of housekeeping. I know that the semester is quickly coming uh, to an end. Uh, and with that, some of you need Christian service assignment hours. And so there is an opportunity that you have this uh, coming weekend. Brother Thomas Snitzler is going to be leading an outreach uh, to Pineville. And so if you'll meet 950 in front of Kelly Hall this Saturday, so just a couple days away, 950 in the morning in front of Kelly Hall, uh, you'll make your way to uh, the city of Pineville to do some door-to-door -door outreach to a project uh, that he had been leading and initiating there through the ministry of First Baptist uh, Pineville. And he'd be glad, love for you to be uh, a part of that. We have as our chapel speaker today, Pastor Jason Moore. He pastors Oklahoma Baptist Church and the Lake Cumberland Association. Uh, he is a trustee of Clear Creek, and we're thankful for his uh, love for this school, this institution. He's one of our alum as well, and we know he had a, has a vested interest in both of those capacities in the work that the Lord is accomplishing here through this school and through you and the mission field and ministry field that you will step into. Uh, as I said, he's an alum of Clear Creek. He also has uh, uh, done some graduate studies at Campbellsville University where he holds a master's degree as well as Andersonville University, currently working on a doctor of theology and pastoral ministry. He's married to Susan, and they have three children and two uh, grandchildren. Brother, you don't strike me as old enough to have two grandchildren. So, amen. The, Lord, the Lord's been good to you, and uh, we just praise his name for that. So I, I've always uh, found this brother to be a friend. He, he is a Barnabas. He is an encourager, always smiling, always uplifting, and I appreciate that about him. So, brother, we're looking forward to you preaching uh, here today. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're our God. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. I thank you for the faculty, students, and staff who are a part of this campus family, and we pray your blessings on our time together today.
today. Lord, may you just uh, be honored and glorified through the singing of your praises, the sacrifice of praise that's on our lips. May you, Father, just put your words in the mouth of your servant today that he would preach in a demonstration of your spirit and your power that we would not hear from a man, but, Lord, that we would hear from the word of God. And, and Lord, we pray that that would stir our hearts. Lord, we do pray, Father, for the work of missionaries around the world. Father, we ask that your anointing be upon them. We pray that you would protect them from the evils of the world. God, we pray that you would give them fruit, Father, for their labor that they would have a kingdom impact and leave a kingdom footprint, Lord, on, on this, uh, this earth, Father, as they are seeking to win folks from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, Lord, whom we know will be gathered before your throne for all eternity. Lord, just meet the needs of our lives. We trust you to do that, knowing you know our needs before we even ask. Lord, we're not fail to thank you for all that you have done and you're going to continue to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together at Clear Creek and worship our Savior. sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless stand before the throne amen give the Lord praise this morning church I'd like to also uh, thank our choir. Uh, the words aren't working on our screen up here, Caleb, but they did a great job of faking it till they made it there. Amen? No. <laughs> That's one thing we talk about in technology and worship. Technology will inevitably fail you, but that will not stop the worship of our Savior. Amen? So with that said, as they're fixing that, let's go ahead, Curtis, and sing Jesus Firm Foundation. Uh, 
how firm, how firm a foundation you saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus has So be not dismayed, for he's our God. He is our God, our sustainer and strength. He'll be, he'll be our defender and cause us to stand. Upheld by his merciful, almighty hand. How firm, how firm our foundation, how sure. soul that is trusting the soul that is trusting in jesus as lord will press on press on enduring the darkest of storms though even trials though even trials should never to shake he'll never never no never no never forsake he'll into our time of prayer. Um, one thing that uh, last night we had a Bible study up at my house and we were talking about the Psalms and in the Psalms you guys probably recognize that there's the a word that pops up in each of the verses that says Selah. In the middle of Selah, that's when they would pause and they would reflect on what they were singing and why they were singing, who they were singing to. And you think about the psalmists and David in particular, what he was going through when he deliberately Selah. He had everything going against him in life, but he deliberately took time to pause and to thank the Lord for what he had done for him and what was going to happen. Even though he had no signs of what was coming, he knew he could trust the Lord. So in this time, whether sitting, standing, or coming to this altar, let us say law together and be still before our Lord.
every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for being that fount, Lord, for being the one we come to, Lord, to be poured into, Lord, so that we can go out and be pouring out to others. And so, God, I pray this morning that we didn't just simply go through the motions, Lord, but we truly meant what we sang, and Lord, that we truly believe that you are the fount, Lord, that supplies everything we need. And now, as we enter into worship through your word, let it come fresh and bold upon us, and bless us as we go through the day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. What a beautiful, beautiful choir and singing that we've had this morning. So humbled to be with you all today. Uh, I do have an outline that was at the front door as you entered in. And uh, I'm going to ask you to do something just briefly. I know you just sat down, but we're going to get our exercise. Would you stand with me all over the, uh, all over the church house this mid-morning here? And so excited. And I'm going to just ask you, if you haven't got one, please get one. But would you just turn to your neighbor and say, hey, it's all about Jesus. Would you do that for just a moment? It's all about Jesus. I mean, that's the bottom line. That's the whole reason why we are here. Now, I'm going to be preaching to you a passage of Scripture this morning that many of you all have heard and have heard and heard. But I want you to note this. It is the greatest sermon and it is the greatest story that has ever been told. I've always said if I ever get another opportunity to be able to come in and preach chapel, this is the message. This is the message for the hour. This is the one that I'd love to be able to share with you. And it is none other than that of John 3.16. Now, I know many of you all don't even have to flip in your Bibles. You should know this one by heart. But I'm going to invite you. Would you just say it with me one more time as we read this scripture together? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Thank you all. Y'all may be seated this morning. I, I want to share with you because I believe this to be one of the greatest verses in the Bible. I have done an in-depth study on this, and what I have found is that it is made up of just 25 words throughout this passage here or throughout this verse. The first 12 words are dealing with that of the relationship of what God has done for us. The last 12 words are going to be dealing with the way that we respond to that which God has done for us. Now I want you to picture that. The first 12 words are that of our God. The last 12 words are that of our decision. And the one word, the 13th word, whatever direction you're going in, that one word that is right in the middle that can connect us to God is that word, Son. And without the Son, there is no connection to that of the Father. And it is the greatest message that could ever be proclaimed. Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer from 1483 to 1546, he called John 3.16 the miniature gospel. It's been said and even been called that it is the gospel in a nutshell. John 3.16 has also been texted as a love letter from God written in blood and addressed to all. It is indeed the greatest story ever been told. If there was ever a verse of Scripture that Satan would love to blot out of this book, it would be John 3.16. If there was ever a verse that makes hell tremble, it would be John 3.16. If there was ever a verse that has lit the path to heaven for souls to be saved, it would be John 3.16. Can I hear an amen to that? John 3.16 has an impact in our life. In fact, it has even been broken down in this fashion. The Bible puts it in fashion of God's grace. For God so loved the world. You could look at it as God's gift. What did He give? That He gave His only begotten Son. You could look at this as God's gospel. That whosoever believeth in Him. And you can see it as God's glory, but have everlasting life in Him. There are so many ways to look at John 3.16, and I'm sure you've heard it proclaimed up one side down the other, but for a moment, I'm going to have an opportunity to teach to you. You see, I've heard it said to me from a former pastor of mine that all teaching is not preaching, but all preaching is must be teaching. And if I have an opportunity today, I want to teach you about John 3.16. You see, let's break it down from the very beginning where it says, For God. For God. Do you think about that verse? When it starts with the terminology of for God, I I can't help but think about being one of my favorite verses, John 3.16, being tied to my favorite verse, which is none other than that of Genesis 1.1. It is my favorite verse. When I sign my name, I sign Genesis 1.1. And that states simply this, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you don't believe that, you're going to have a real hard time with the rest of the book, folks, I'll guarantee you. It just simply states out with the same. Well, where did God come from? Who made God? What's the existence of God? God is who He says that He is from the very beginning. God doesn't have to prove Himself to you. He is before time. He is all time. He is everything. It just simply states His eternal existence starting from the point of for God. It is from God. Who God is for God. He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the creator of everything and anything that has been made. So you say, well, what about this God? What did He do? Who is He? Am I, can I really be convinced that He is the creator of all things? Moses, even whenever he went up onto the mount and was communing with God, receiving that of the Ten Commandments, he was to go down and present that to the people As he receives those Ten Commandments, he's fixing to take them. He says, who do I tell them sent me? And God said this. He said, you tell them I am who I say that I am. His word is sufficient and he is the one that has authored it, penned it for I believe in all 66 
books of the Bible. Some say I believe it from Genesis to maps. God is the one who is, uh, His Holy Spirit has ordained it, put it together for us to have it. But here's the bottom line. So many people question the existence of God. He is who He says that He is. And think of it as this. There cannot be a here without a there. There cannot be a before without an after. There cannot be an upper without a lower. And there cannot be a creation without a creator. Amen? God is who He says that He is. So what did this God do? I mean, if He's God and He's made everything, what did He do? The Bible says this, that He so loved. Now what does it mean that He, that he so loved? What is love? Love is something that is very difficult to define, especially within the Greek terminology. But if you think about the author here who has penned this, of course the Holy Spirit's inspiration, but within John's gospel, John was known as the beloved disciple. It's fitting that he wrote the word love or loved some 56 times in the book of John. It is referenced love. No wonder he was the beloved disciple. The dictionary has said that love is having a feeling, trying to describe this, a feeling, an affection, or a regard for, to be strongly attached or attracted toward, to hold dear. There are also synonyms like affection and charity, devotion, fondness, liking, and even passion. We can all try to describe love. I love cream horns. I love donuts, but I'm a diabetic and I can't have them. And I want these things. I love, I love trucks. I love puppies. I, lo I love things. But yet, so how do you describe love? I love my children, my grandchildren, my, my wife. But all these things are surpassed when he uses two little letters that he places in front of love. He's so loved. I can't. Imagine this love, that He so loved you. He so loved you. It's almost like someone saying, well, how are you doing on your final? Well, I got to be so. <laughs> I got to see, you know. So it superpasses it. So I got something more. I've got my love for you surpasses anything that you could ever imagine it. In fact, the mind of mankind can never fully grasp the love of God. All we can say is, is that God's love for us is uncaused. It's uninfluenced. It's, it's spontaneous. In fact, God's love for us is sovereign that He knows all. He knows you who you are and yet He loves you anyway. Deuteronomy speaks of it in, in verses 7 through 7, 8. God loved you just simply because He loves you. You're not worthy of it, but He just loves you. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. He loves you, even with the thought that you have, even with what's going through your mind right now, even if you're focused on Him or if you're not focused on Him. He just loves you because He cannot help Himself. Now, I want you to think about who God is. He is the creator of it all, and He loves you. It's easy to tell somebody, I love you, but when you say, I so love you, the depth of that goes beyond our comprehension. So what did he love? He loved the world. Well, what is this of the world? John here in, the, that in his writings, he uses the word or the terminology of the world some 77 times throughout the Gospel of John. 77 times referencing the world. And what is that of the world? Now, I'm not talking about the matter or the physical makeup or the minerals and all that of the earth just so much. Now, I'm a very literal reader. Don't take that out of context. But you are in this world. And to think about every individual within this world referencing you who are in this world, the creation that God has made, He loves uh, the world. And that definition would be you. The God, I want you to know this. You say, well, I know God loves me, but what about others? Listen, God loves the Jews, even though they didn't fully acknowledge His Son, Jesus Christ. God loves the Russian. God loves the Chinese. God loves the Arabs. In fact, God even loves the Americans as far gone as we've gone. God loves the civilized as well as God loves the heathen. God loves the Baptist, and I are one, as well as the Methodist. 
God loves the Presbyterian as well as God loves the Lutheran or the or the even the, God loves the Catholic. God loves them. Now you say, whoa, brother Jason, you're getting too far gone. God loves the fundamentalist as well as he does the liberal. God even loves the communist. You say, where are you going with this? I'm glad you ask. God loves all political affiliations. He still loves them. He loves the people. But hear this. You may be surprised to know this, but did you know God even loves the preacher? as well as he does the prostitute, because I'm no better. I just put my faith in God, and yet God loved me anyway. You know, God loves the murderer as well as the gambler. God loves the bartender. God loves all colors, shapes, and sizes. He loves all social groups, because the Bible says, For God so loved a a world full of saints. No, God loved a world full of sinners. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Whatever title, whatever we say we want to look like, God loves you just simply because He loves you and you are in the world. And if you wanted to replace that, and I know you've all been asked to do that before, but sometimes people have a hard time realizing that you are worthy and that God loves you. And you could replace that word world with your name because you're in this world. So it's real easy and maybe we just need to try it this morning. And replace the word world with your name. Say it with me, please. For God so loved Jason. I don't know if y'all really believe that or not, but say your name in that place. For God so loved you. I don't know why. I don't know why he called us the way that he has. While we have the opportunities to do what we're getting to do. But God loves us. And because he loves us, I want you to hear this. We have such a great responsibility because He loves the sinner but not the sin. You say, well, God's all love. And somewhere the gospel has went to this love and touchy feeling that a God of love would never be harsh or punishable or anything like that. God is love. So hear me clearly. God loves the criminal but He hates the crime. God loves the rebel but He hates the rebellion. God loves the liar but he hates the lie. And God loves the adulterer, but he hates the idol. God loves you simply because he loves you. So it's easy to say I love you, but what are you going to do with this love? I love you, but prove it. God proves it. What did he do? The Bible says that he gave. What does he give? What is this sacrifice? I'm afraid today that the world knows very little about sacrifice. You guys are sacrificing. I get it. I've been where you are. I've had to do many of the things that you've done. You have given up things in this world to be able to do the ministry in in the world that we're in now. And there's nothing that I ever gave up that God has not ever given me back more than I could ever imagine. I wouldn't replace it for anything. But the sacrifice that God made, what He gave, the world knows very, very little about giving because we'll give, but we don't give till it hurts. We don't sacrifice everything but we'll give some. We'll hold some back. We'll we'll, we'll refrain from it. You see, God didn't do that. God didn't just say, I love you and I'm going to prove my love for you. I'm going to give you a thousand cattle on these hills. In fact, I'll give you the hills. God's not going to say, well, you know what? I love you and I'm going to give you the fluffiest cloud. I'm going to sacrifice the prettiest angel. No, I want you to know what he gave. What he gave was, is he gave of himself. And that meaning of suffering. And today we, we, we really don't understand what it means to give everything that we have. And often we talk about, we're getting ready for Christmas, I get it, and uh, upcoming Easter that won't be too far following that. But many times we talk about that giving and the sacrifice of the Son of Jesus Christ. But have you ever really thought about the sacrifice of the Father? As a dad and as a grandpa... I see things a little bit differently. Is I, I, Could you imagine looking out your window and seeing your children and seeing an angry mob out there laughing at him, mocking him, ridiculing him, beating him, 
Hitting them knowing you had all power to go out there and to rescue and to lift up and say, not my son, not my beloved boy. There is no way I would be willing or wanting to do that. I, 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 there's no way that I would be willing to want to see. I mean, we'd say, yes, I give all, I, there, all the sacrifice. But even the cross itself, I think about, he knew the tree that was going to grow to be the cross. He, I, if I saw that tree, if I saw the tree that was going to be the cross, if I saw that root start to sprout up out of the ground, I would have struck it with a bolt of lightning. I would have went over and plucked it up by the roots and say, "Not today, not today." There's an old song that it, it stated, "He knew the tree." I'm sorry, he grew the tree that he knew the, that it would be the cross of Calvary. How could you do that? To look out and know that it was going to be your son, your child who is going to be given as a sacrifice for those who did not deserve it, those who did not deserve love, those that have rebelled, those that have ran, and yet he was willing to do it. He gives the ultimate sacrifice as the Father. He doesn't just give you the partial. He gives you the best gift that he possibly has. So what did he give? He gave his only begotten Son. Right here again, I see, even within the book of Genesis, we see the evidence of the Trinity, for we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because see, Jesus Christ did not just come into existence some 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ has always been. He has always existed. It's always been the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And yet Jesus Christ was willing to step out of heaven, put on human flesh for you and for me. Why? Why would He do that? He came here as a result of a rescue mission to save the sick, to save the lost, to save the sinner, you and me. And who is that? Folks, that is the whosoever. Whosoever. You see, I know that there's doctrines and philosophies and all that other stuff out there, but the Scripture is very clear and very plain. Whosoever is just that. Whosoever. Ever. Can I hear an amen? amen? I could go into it a lot depth, more in depth, but you've got professors that will take you to that. This verse says, whosoever, this means all. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And my friends, all need a Savior, and that means anyone who will. And I want you to know this. Unfortunately, there's a doctrine out there that says some say they get in and some say they can't get in and some want to get already done and some not gotten done. Let me tell you, let me just break it down to you real simple and real easy. You're not so good that God's got to let you in. And you're not so bad that you can't ask God for forgiveness. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. God's gospel is available to all, whosoever will. And you can't get in on your own merit. You can't get in on your own uh, good deeds or your looks or your shapes or where you were born or just because you're in a church or you're out of a church. Listen, how do you get in then? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. We hit that 13th word. That whosoever, whosoever what? How do you get in then? The Bible says, believeth. And that is by faith. And by faith alone is the only way that you're going to be able to inherit the kingdom of God. That is the only way is that you are going to be able to accept that blood of Jesus Christ. For here within the gospel of John and going through this and combing through it, he uses the term believe or believeth some 100 times within the gospel of John. Do you not think faith is important that you must believe that that is the only way you're able to receive that of gift of salvation and other than that of Jesus Christ? You see, you say, why are you bringing this message to us? We're at a, we're at a college. We're here studying. We, we, we know all this stuff. I'm glad you asked why I'm bringing this passage of Scripture. And I have a conviction and a core conviction to bring this because keeping it in the context of the Scripture of when this verse was actually written, there was a conversation that was being dialogued between that of Nicodemus who came to meet Jesus at night and having that conversation with Jesus Christ. You see, Nicodemus himself was a student of the Word. He was a studier of the Word of God. He was a philosopher of the Word of God. He, he, he looked at the Word of God. He, he, he studied these things and yet he was moral. He was rich. He was a do-gooder. 
He was a, even a church member there. He was within it all. He had all these things. But you know what Nicodemus was? Nicodemus was lost. And apart from Jesus Christ, you can do all those things. You can have the look. You can have the walk. You can have the talk. But apart from Jesus Christ, you're as lost as lost can be by faith. And he says this, What must I do to be born again? In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we see the doors of heaven swing on this experience. We can only be saved by faith, not by works. I work not to get saved. I work because I am saved. I'm not telling you nothing new, but we need to be reminded of these things. That our salvation rests in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. In Him. Acts 4.12 and in John 5.12 we see that it shows us that salvation is in a person. And that person is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Listen, I've been mistaken by folks to come up and I have to stop and correct them whenever they may see you or they may pause at you and say, there's the person that saved me. That's the church that saved me. Listen, you can shake my... I'll go back here, I'll shake your hands and you can shake my hand till my fingernails pop off. That's not going to save you. You can get in the waters of baptism. I can baptize you once, twice, get you all pruny and wet and all these other things. Baptism is not going to save you. It shows that I got saved. Listen, you can have your church, you can have your name on the church roll. You can have your name on the church books. You could have a grandpa that was a pastor. My grandpa went here to Clear Creek. That's not going to save me. Only faith and believing in Him, Him being Jesus Christ, the finished work of God Almighty, the Son of God, the one who gave everything for us. It's not by being a good preacher. It's not being a church member, a good Christian. It's in Christ and Christ alone, all in Him, that we're able to make it to the other side. Every walk, every creed, whomever it is, if they place their simple faith and trust in Jesus Christ, in Him. Now here's the benefit. You see, this is something that unfortunately we just preach the love of God without the righteousness and the full counsel of God and yet some have preached on this, should not perish. Now, some preach hell, fire, and brimstone and it needs to be preached and it has its place as well and I'm not trying to scare you into that but the fact of the matter is is that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Amen? There is no in-between. There is no purgatory time. There is no second chance. For only in that of Jesus Christ do we have that opportunity to enter into heaven. You see, the bottom line to this is is that hell is real. It was intended for the devil and his angels. You can read Revelation 12. You can see that one-third of the angels chose to follow that of free will. They had an option. Choose God or choose the devil. One went with the devil, two went with God. One went with the devil, two went with God. And here we go. We can go down the line. The bottom line to this is, is you have a free will and a choice as well to accept heaven or to deny heaven. And you say, well, I haven't made up my mind yet. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll put it off or I'll wait and see. The Bible says today is the day of salvation and I encourage you to make heaven your home. Do not put it off for there is a heaven to gain. He, wa- he loves you so much. He loves you that He's willing to give of Himself, sacrifice of Himself, lay down His life for you to be able to go to this place called heaven. Now I want you to note this. You can have that of everlasting life. Oh, what a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. Everlasting life. Listen to me. Hear me clearly. I've been preaching almost 20 years. I don't want to just go to heaven because of all the stuff. I don't want to go to heaven just because of the gold streets, the transparent glass the beauty of the rivers and the seas and all these other things. I I don't want to just go to heaven because my grandpa is there and all the friends that I've unfortunately, but fortunately as well, done the funerals for that I hope to see and gain and seeing over there. You know why I want to go to heaven? Because Jesus Christ is there. And if there's none of that other stuff except for him, that's heaven to me. 
the one who laid down his life for me. The one who laid down his life for you. John makes mention here within the Gospel of John, that reference of life. What is life? He mentions it some 36 times in the Gospel of John. 36 times he talks about life, having that life in the book of John. And he talks about for God. I love this because if you notice John 3.16, it begins with that of for God. And it ends with that word life. If you've got God, you've got life. Now I'm not just talking about eternal existence because you will spend an eternity somewhere. And that eternal existence will be that within the, in the realm of God Almighty or that within the devil and hell. And I'm not just talking about eternal existence. I'm talking about life because all sinners will have their place in judgment. And judgment is, is either he's paid his price for you and you've accepted it or you've denied it. So what is this everlasting life? As I'm, gonna bring this, I'm bringing this to a close, guys. It's a short message. I didn't give you a lot of illustrations. I didn't tell you a lot of jokes. I just want you to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and never forget to put those things first and foremost in it all. What is everlasting life? It's having Jesus. He said in John 14, 6, I am the life. And because He is the Savior of my life, I have the greatest life that you could ever imagine. I'm happy. I do love to laugh. I love to joke. I want to be an encourager. I'm here to motivate you. I'll help you any way that I can. My library is open to you. Anything I got, it's, it's yours. The outline you got, it's yours. Take it. Use it. Share it. Please, by all means, share this message with as many as you come in contact with. It, it, it's, I, we have a great life. Isn't this awesome what we get to do to be here at Clear Creek today, to be able to study God's Word? It, it is an amazing life because He is life. The Bible says life is in the Son, and whosoever has the Son has life. John eleven twenty five 25 says, I am the resurrection and the life. And John 1, 4 says, in him was life. Folks, I'm going to bring it to a close this morning. I'm humbled that anybody would listen to me. And it's not in the deliver, but it is in the message itself that is an awesome, powerful thing. And I encourage you. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, and you say, I'm at school, I'm here at college. I didn't ask you if you was in school. I didn't ask you if you was a church member. I didn't ask you if you've been baptized. Have you placed your faith in all the work that what God has done, those first 12 words, and who you are with the choice you've got, hanging between heaven and earth on that cross was the Son. And apart from the Son, you can have no life. If there was any other way, I'd tell you. If there was any other way and any other gospel that we should preach or proclaim, I'd tell you. But my friends, there is no other gospel. And there is no other way to uh, heaven except through Jesus Christ. You say, you're pretty narrow-minded. You mean you can't get to heaven no other way? I'm so narrow-minded I can look through a keyhole with both eyes. I I'm telling you, it is only by the blood of Jesus Christ that men can be saved. Amen? Amen. That's it. Period. Because I'm saved, I want to see everybody go. I can't make it happen for you. I can't do it for you. I can't go back there and get you. I can't drag you up. It's by simple faith. Sometimes we as ministers of the gospel can make it real hard to get saved, and it's not. Just believe. The Bible says this as I come across a poem that put it this way. For God... The Lord of earth and heaven so loved and longed to see forgiven the world in sin and pleasure mad that he gave the only son that he had. His only son to take our place that whosoever, oh, what grace, believeth, placing simple trust in him, the righteous and the just, should not perish, 
lost in sin, but have everlasting life in Him. Would you pray with me? Our most kind, gracious and loving God, but righteous and just. Lord, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, today. For there is no other way to approach the throne. No one can come to you except through Him. And Lord, I'm, we've invited your Holy Spirit, and I believe your Holy Spirit is present right now. Lord, I pray that if there's one within an earshot of my voice, whether watching or congregational present, Lord, I pray that they would evaluate their life and they would just evaluate that to say just by simple faith, have I placed my trust? Have I accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ Almighty? And if so, praise God. Angels in heaven rejoice as Luke talks about. But Lord God, I pray we would rejoice as well if there's one here that they would do that. And if we have done that, then let us be mindful when things get tough, when things get hard, when this old world seems to be going crazy and someone asks, why is everything in this world going on around us? Why do we have to deal with sickness, disease, COVID, all this other stuff? Lord, where are you? Where were you when so-and-so passed? Where were you, God, when such and such? Why don't God do something? Let us be vessels of reminders that you did do something. You didn't just do something temporal. You didn't just fix the issue that was at hand. You made things available for all of eternity. When you sent Jesus Christ and He stepped out of heaven, clothed Himself in flesh, laid down His life, the ultimate love sacrifice to pay a sin debt to which He did not owe so that we can have life and have life more abundantly. Lord, I pray for all these here, once they've accepted, that they would go out and rescue the perishing, that they would go out and tell the story of Jesus Christ, the greatest story ever told. In Jesus' name, amen.